Welcome to episode 297 of Shop Talk Live. Today, I am joined by Vic Teslin and the one and only Gary Rogowski. And we talk about a lot of things. We talk about band saws and how they're the most important hand tool you can own. We talk about the fiddliness of working with hinges and whether using a 45 degree chamfer bit will work for box miners. Before we get started, Sarah from Marketing wanted me to tell you that if you look down on the planets from their North Poles, Venus is the only planet that rotates clockwise and it orbits the sun counterclockwise. She also wanted me to let you know that registration is open for Matt Monaco's turning class. Uh, it's our new e-learning class where Matt teaches you decorative turning techniques from basic bowl forms to live edge turnings and fancy finials with captured rings, all sorts of cool stuff. If you're like me and consider yourself more of a lathe owner than a turner, this course will get you on your way to never having to buy a wedding present ever again. You're just gonna make something for them in 20 minutes and they're gonna ooh and all over it and love it. The class starts in October and you can find out more information at findwoodworking.com slash e-learning. Head on over there right now and on with the show. This first question is from Mike. I've bumped into an issue on several cabinets I've made, hoping you have some strategies. Even though I take great care to glue up my carcasses and doors flat and square, I sometimes end up with a door that's slightly proud of the front of the carcass at the top or the bottom for an inset door. I use Pekovic's technique for routing hinge mortises, no apparent issue there. On a recent bookcase, I checked the carcass and each door on my table saw, surface plate in quotes, and they were each within one playing card of dead flat. But when everything was together, I had a noticeable misalignment at the top or at the bottom, flush at the top. Do you have any techniques for small adjustments to the hinges to reduce the gap? I'd rather not play in the door surfaces as they would dis as it would disrupt the offsets between the rails and styles. I use rare earth magnets as at the top as catches. I could add another set at the bottom to bend the door into submission, but that feels clunky. So this Gary, you look ready to go. What's up? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I built a cabinet for a show up in Alaska, um, furniture from the Tongass. And I got all this spruce sent to me by mail. Pretty cool. And I built this cabinet and um, used knife hinges for the hinges and, and sent it up there. It came back, didn't sell. Uh, so I had the piece and I nailed it. I got to say. The reveals were perfect all the way around the door, just set in just a hair flush from the edge of the cabinet, and it was great. And 10 years later, it was a really hot summer, and the top part of the door just went eek, it just moved in, just the top part. And you probably wouldn't notice it, but I noticed it because it was really close to perfect. I try and do that, but wood moves. It's, a, it's an issue. So you do the best you can. I, I would say I would suggest if he doesn't want to trim the door that he trim the edge of the of the case, and that would be a fairly easy solution, I think. But usually, I trim the door. Trim the edge of the case. Oh, yes. So the case. I assume it's a full inset door. It sounds that, that way. Yes, that was yeah. yeah. That was my assumption. That was a full inset door, and so the edge of the case, if it's not perfectly true, or if the door is not perfectly true, you're going to have that twist or you know edge of the door sticking out or sticking in. So you've got a choice, one or the other. You you trim the door, you trim the case, and it sounds like you didn't want to trim the door, so trim the case. I I would be really careful every. I am really careful every time I install a door. So the way, if I got it right, and then I take screws out because I've got to finish it or do something to the inside of the piece or something, I put it back together the exact same way. The hinges are numbered. I know which one goes where. I mean, every, the screws, everything goes back exactly the same way if you've gotten it to a spot that's that's good. So you want to recreate that. And there's... So many little things I can throw it off. Vic, what's your uh, 
What's your take? Um, in the past, I've liked to set a depth reveal as well, um, just so that you're not trying to get flush and flush because like getting flush and flush is, is, can be difficult. More importantly, as Gary alluded to, wood moves, uh, which may come to a surprise to some people. And so, you know, over time, you know, and, and it could be like just a summer of sunlight coming in the window and kind of baking one side of the cabinet or something like that. And it can move and do all of its fun stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think in this case here, if you don't want to take material off the door, then you got to take material off of somewhere. And so if you're concerned about that, and so like Gary suggested, putting it, you know, trimming the gable a little bit so that it matches up works and uh, cannot uh, agree more with um, being careful with your hinges, right? Gary's got the right of it. You want to label those. You want to make sure that you remember what screws came from what side. There's all kinds of tiny little differences and like hinges, depending on where you source them from, you know, they look the same. They are not the same. <laughs> Um, and even companies, I'm not going to name any names, but even companies that in the past did a really good job at making like products have started to slip where you're not getting the, you know, like the pins aren't perfectly straight or the leaves are not perfectly flush with each other. Um, there's play in between the, uh, knuckles, whereas before you know, there was none of that. And so <clears throat> it seems like if you can get hinges from like a bespoke maker, somebody who's really like, but of course you pay for that, right? Mm -hmm. You're talking about, you know, 150 bucks, 200 bucks for a set of hinges, but they're going to be guaranteed to, to work. Um, you know, but the, but yeah, the hardware is the big deal. Like if you think, you know, hanging a door and putting a $20 set of hinges on it is going to get it to hang right. Yeah. It's not, it's not going to work. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, like doors and lids that like they're, they're not as simple as it looks. Um, you know, they, it seems like, Oh, I just hinged the door. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. But there's a whole pile of, there's a whole pile of, there's, there's a 25, point checklist in installing the hinges that really are going to make a huge difference to the outcome of the project. Um, and I mean, I, I, I did, when I was a student at Rosewood, I did a, a guitar cabinet with a curved front door. I did those hinges three times because <laughs> I had, I, I didn't have like a flat reference. So like, and then just like, one leaf buried slightly deeper than the other. And then like, you know, you're putting like veneer packer in there to try to, but no, but that's too much. And then you're like, well, how do I take a thousandth of an inch off of this veneer? And it just, you know, it was a nightmare. And, um, and you just have to know that going in. So I think, you know, there's trials and tribulations for all of that hardware. The older I get, the less I like hardware. It's hard to get good hardware. And it's just like, I don't know, last few boxes I've made, it had lift top lids because <laughs> just the thought of putting a quadrant hinge in where both quadrant hinges are not the same size, dimension, angle, all that stuff. No, thanks. Yeah. So, okay. So for Mike, uh, Gary, if you, so this is, he, he's got a flat door. He installs it. It's off you're taking that door off, right? What are you doing yeah. to, I mean, this isn't 10 years down the road. This is right now. What are you doing to alleviate this issue now? And let's, let's just assume regular old butt hinges or, or whatever. Butt hinges. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, if say the bottom of the door is, is kicked out a little bit, I want to point out his uh, suggestion to put on a stronger, rare earth magnet unless they're really really strong is not gonna not gonna help and not 
not pull things in. Plus, you're going to have and to like exactly to get yeah, the, the door stronger open. they are, the harder it's going to be to open. Yeah. That's going to yeah. I mean, you put on one of those three way catches, which is what I use most of the time, and they start off, and you go, God, that's so hard. And, but they wear in over time, and they they feel pretty good. But so I would avoid the rare earth magnet pulling it out of or into true approach. And I would take the door off. If it's that bottom hinge, you can always reset the, the hinge mortise. If, if it needs to go in just a hair, mm -hmm. try the screws. That, that probably won't work, but you can try because <laughs> the screw head is, since it's uh, has that countersunk shape, that angled head, flathead screw is going to go back to the screw hole on the, on the hinge leaf. So fill the screw holes and drill new holes. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it's that, that, bothersome to you and just it doesn't take that long to drill an eighth inch hole glue in an eighth inch dowel move the move the screw over sometimes you can do that with just one screw and that would if it can pivot and then you just if you're just mortising in you're not mortising up or down then there's no you don't have to clean or patch anything so that's that's fairly simple it depends a little bit I'm with Vic. I, you know, my door's inset just a hair, so it's not. When it gets out of perfect, you don't really notice because it's already imperfect, so to speak. It depends a lot on the door, and it sounded like his uh, rails and styles were not flush. So tough to take material off one of those. So work on the case, but the case needs to be true before you set your door in place and if you haven't checked it with i don't care about square but i do care about how true it is if you haven't checked it with winding sticks then you're just i'm gonna have to deal with that down the road with your door and you don't want to deal with that you really want to have have that as true and flat as possible and yeah wood moves so um you know, another solution is just to kick it in and just kick everything in just a little bit. But just inset there's another, the whole thing deeper. Yeah, I just inset the whole thing. Now, if it's a knife hinge, everything's changed. Yeah. Um, you've got to you gotta nail those right from the start. And once you learn how to do that, I don't I find them you know, pretty easy to put in. But your it's your layout that's really the key. Everything else it's is pretty simple. And I I don't have a template for routing them. I freehand them in. But as you know, as as uh the cranky old man points out, um, you know, hinges have changed. You know, it's hard to deal with these old guys, you know, and it's um, back in my day, hinges lined yeah, up right I, out of the package. Hinges were good, but nowadays <laughs> uh, Well, where where's your spit can by the <laughs> Wait, wait, wait for, Set this off that. to the side here. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, then, you know, uh, touches, I I don't trust at all. I mean, I clean those up and flatten them and re countersink the holes on them and completely clean those up. Um, depends on, you know, whether you're buying the extruded hinges or the rolled pin hinges. And if you're doing that, then yeah. It's, they're not never going to fit great. So, um, yeah, you do get what you pay for. I I wish I knew the full um, write up, but Nancy Hiller one time wrote a blog for us about how she sometimes leans towards more exp more inexpensive hinges because she can modify them easier. So uh, I will I will post a link um, to her blog in the show notes. Vic, have, have you ever installed hinges with just one screw in order to give yourself, cause I know Tom McLaughlin will sometimes, or I think always do one screw, get, make sure everything fits right. And then, because if it doesn't, he's got more options, then he's got more screw holes to, to, to try in. Have, have you ever tried that? Yeah, I, I have. The, the thing that I do, though, is if I'm using one screw per, per leaf, then th that's really for, like, a gross 
sort of like, is this going to fit? Okay. Is the door going to close? Is the, you know, all that other stuff. Like I find that, um, if you don't have all the screws in, because it could work fine with one screw, you put a second or a third screw in and all of a sudden it's not working. Okay. Right. And that's as simple as you've got the sh shoulder of the screw slightly, you know, left or right of the the countersink and then now that's pushing it. And so I remember learning a trick from Adrian Ferrazzuti where he stuck, um, um, remember the, the toothpicks, not the round ones, but the flat toothpicks. And he would put flat toothpicks, like if he thought that that hinge had to go like just a whisper in, really? he would put flat toothpicks on the outside of the hole and then put the screw back in and that pushes the screw just just a little Just bit enough. to the other side. And so like that's the, how I always sort of fine tune things is that like, if it needs to come in or it needs to come out. And again, Gary's 100% right, layout. Like if you're gonna punch a hole, like, you know what I mean? Don't just grab one of those Home Depot hinge punches and, you know, hope that that's gonna go right in the center. Um, you know, I've always like been very careful with a VIX bit. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, carefully get down in there. And I even start, like I even use an awl to start that hole because like even if the VIX bit is like leaning one way or the other, you know, you're going to get a bad hole. That's and then all of a sudden suspenders. your screw is going in at a little bit of an angle and that little bit of an angle pushes on the hinge. Like it's fussy. It's fussy stuff. You really I mean, it's not hardware. building guitars, but it's close. <laughs> You really hate hardware. <laughs> I, well, I don't hate it. I just, I know going into it that there's, it's not, it's not like your checklist point says install hinges, right? Like there's, <laughs> there's 25 things that come under install hinges that you have to pretty much nail or like Gary said, you're going to have trouble. And yeah. step one is the carcass. If you put your carcass on the table saw flat surface and it goes tick, 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 tick. You know what I mean? That'd be like cutting dovetails. Like the carcass is like the pattern, right? That has to be nailed. Uh, yeah. Dead, okay. flush, dead, flat, no twist. If it has any twist, it's like a dovetail. You cut the tail and if they're tapered in ever so slightly and then you use that to mark your pin, you're done. Yep. I go even one step further. So I don't put, I don't check my cabinet on the table saw. I build a special platform to build my cabinet on. So I have special saw horses that uh, I can, I have both two foot and three foot tall saw horses. And I put a sheet of plywood, either it's a four by four sheet or a four by eight sheet on these saw horses and connect the saw horses together. They're, they're just T-shaped. Put a diagonal on them. And then I true the saw horses and the piece of plywood. So I know that that surface is now dead flat and I build the cabinet on that. And so um, you can build a piece and set the door and it goes to a client's house, it goes to your house and the door doesn't open. <laughs> you go, wait a second. And it's all a question. I mean, doors are 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 cabinets without you know struts across the front, like a chest of drawers, it has a real tendency to rack, you know, depending on how the floor is underneath you. So I can tell my client, look, I built your piece at the center of the universe. It's just my bench. <laughs> my bench is the center of the universe. And it gets to your house and it's, I'll, I'll get you some shims and we'll, we'll fix it. Yeah. But uh, that same knife hinge cabinet, that spruce cabinet, I put it on one side of my door at home and it's perfect. And I put it on the other side of the door and I need a quarter inch shim underneath it. Wow. Old house. Yeah. And the door won't open and the reveals go wonky on you and it's just, it's terrible. So things can really change. So building it on something that you trust, that's just dead true uh, is really important. I find. I know Peter Galbert has like a little platform, like a perfectly flat platform for testing rockers on. 
And he yeah. says, it'll never be on anything this true ever again. And it's in right. its existence, you know, but he knows that it rocked perfectly on that platform and that's all he right. can ask for. Yeah. That's yeah. all you can do. You can't, you don't know where the piece is going to go. But let's also point this out. I started, um, getting on some lists, uh, you know the Jack Plane uh, blog? It's a guy, it's an antique dealer down in Australia. I don't know how I found him, but uh, he's a cranky old guy. I like him. And uh, he says, oh, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a, sh uh, an auction in London and these pieces are going to be sold. And this piece is, you know, a George III, you know, table. And he goes on about it for a little while. And, um, He's got uh, an eye for, you know, nice antiques. But if you go and actually look at the pieces or go to a museum and see how they've lasted over time, you go, oh, God, that door doesn't sit that well. And mm -hmm. that looks crooked. And some pieces, you know, they're, they're racking and they're quite valuable. So... It gets it gets one to the question of uh, who are we building for? Are we building for the for the ages? Or are we building for ourselves? I'm building for myself. I, I used to think myself. I was building for the ages. I'm building for myself. Yeah, yeah. I'm not yeah, looking for anything that. to last past me. <laughs> <laughs> Twenty minutes, good enough. Yep, good enough. Yeah, it looked good enough for, remember, long, for I, just long enough to post that Instagram shot. Exactly, that's all that matters. <laughs> if it's if it's on Instagram, that's and then it can fall apart. I don't care. I think somebody on this show one time said uh, it was probably Mike that was like, "Yeah, when you build multiple drawers, there's at least one corner dovetail that's good enough for a cover shot. <laughs> that's all that matters." <laughs> it's so true, and you know, and that's part of the problem. I think is that on Instagram and, and all those things, we see the one corner of the box that that person nailed, Yep. right? The other ones could look like garbage, right? And I don't even mean garbage. I mean, if there's a gap in a dovetail, right? Okay, let's not get too dear about this. I mean, especially if you've hand cut them and you've done all that other stuff, like people have put way too much pressure on themselves, right? Everybody has a bad day in the shop once in a while and you end up with an errant cut and it, it, you know, it happens. And I think like, I don't really fuss too much about that stuff. I always endeavor to do the best work that I can. And that's all I can ask for myself. And if my, if I don't like the work that I'm doing, then I'm just going to practice more. And I'm going to get better at it. And then, then I'll be happy with it. But for the most part, I think, you know, we live in this world where everything's made through CNC and, and fabricated and like, you know, it goes in a tree, comes out a piece of flat pack furniture and everything goes together perfect. And there's no gaps and everything's dead flat. And it's like, that's just not realistic when you're working as a person in your shop. So don't expect it. And and is perfection really a goal? I mean, right. it's a sickness. I, I've suffered from it, but I, I'm, you know, I'm working hard at doing, I tell my students, D don't design the best piece ever because you put so much pressure in, but design the second best piece ever. Right. You know, because you're killing yourself. I had a student who did, he was in the mastery program for one term, did a beautiful piece, just a gorgeous piece. And there aren't many pieces that I looked at over the years and say, I wish I had done that piece. And that was one of them. And, and he said, I can't take it. It's not perfect. I just can't, t I just can't do this work. It's just not perfect. My God, lighten up, but he couldn't. And he, he quit doing, I'd still see him around, but he, yeah, I couldn't let go of those impossible standards. Right now, I'm in the process of, of doing some timber framing. I'm telling myself that I have eighth-inch standards, which is really tough for me because <laughs> I work with the 2000s at feeler gauge for my joinery. And all I bought all these timbers when 
the, the price of lumber was through the roof. So I, it captured the heart. So the pith is right in the, right in the middle of these six by sixes and the boards are, or the sticks are twisted and cracked. And I started uh, putting in these dovetail keys to, you know, see if I could slow down the cracking. And uh, God, the first five or six of them that I put in were just, you know, and now I am, I'm putting one in every 15 and they're not the same. They're not perfect. I don't care. Because it's going up in a structure and it's yeah. going to be 10 feet up. And I'm going to go, yeah, I put those in. They look good. Yeah. There's uh and, and the fact that they're not all the same, they're not all cut out of the same template, like a, you know, a router jig is good. It just, it shows when you walk through the gamble house, have you been to the gamble house? Got to no. go there. Oh, you got to go there. Get to Pasadena and go, where is this place? And you walk in there, it looks like someone, this is the house uh, built by Green and Green, 1906 or something, for the Gambles. Uh, it was their summer home. And when you walk in, there are square pegs everywhere on this staircase leading upstairs. Like someone came in with a gun and was just like, bam, 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 putting in square pegs everywhere and, that tool. <laughs> yeah uh and then you look at them and they're not all the same and some aren't square and you go this is great <laughs> this shows that this there was someone doing this they're not all the same they're not punched in they're chiseled in individually by hand and it just gives it such a different feel such a different flavor it gives it life and uh that's yeah that's perfection <laughs> Hartville Hardware is your woodworking headquarters. Are you looking for a place to get everything you need to keep your workshop running? Hartville Hardware is the place to go. They carry the entire Festool lineup as well as a huge selection from Robert Sorby, Crown Tools, Woodpeckers, Tormek, and Milwaukee. Hartville Hardware offers so much more than tools. They have durable workwear from Carhartt and drinkware from Yeti. Head on over to heartfillhardware.com slash FWW to sign up for their Festool email list for a chance to win a Festool item for your workshop. Shop heartfillhardware.com, your woodworking headquarters. All right, let's see. This question is from Art. <clears throat> I've had this question before too. I generally mill my wood about three eighths of an inch thick for box making. What are your thoughts about cutting box sides to length on the table saw or miter saw for dimensioning and then using a router table with a 45 degree chamfer bit to introduce a predictable angle to them? 45 degrees. Eliminating a great deal of setup time. The final step would be fine tuning on a shooting board. This approach doesn't get much discussion. I'm guessing there must be a reason. Vic? I tried it once. <laughs> Theoretically, it works like a champ. <laughs> what could go wrong? What could go wrong? Right? Exactly. Your pieces yeah. are exactly the same. You set your bearing on your on your chamfer bit flush with the fence, and you just push it across, generating a forty five degree angle, and bingo, bango, it all comes together, right? No, it doesn't come together. In fact, it does the opposite of come together. Um, <laughs> it leads to drinking, much like <laughs> mathematics. <laughs> um, because when you go in with the presumption that, that that router bit, in fact, is 45 degrees, right? Which you cannot assume, right? You're also assuming that that router's 45 degree cutter is perfectly plumb in the table, right? You're assuming that the table and the router shaft are perfectly, right? And this is a game of like, this is a game of, of, of micro degrees here, right? Minutes. So like, if you have 40, 45.2, on every one of your corners, you're getting gaps. And so like, and you also have to assume that the board as it's going across is having equal pressure placed down on it. 
mm-hmm. and you're getting the same depth of cut. And all of there, there's so much that can go wrong. This is like the door, right? Like, it, like theoretically, you just put the hinges on, right? <laughs> and this is the exact same thing. So, like, my 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 thought is is that if you want to get a rough 45 on there and then take it over to the shooting board with the donkey's ear and trim it up, that that's great. Um, do not think for a minute that you're going to come. And I don't think you should think for a minute that you're coming off of any machine and not having to fettle just a little bit, right? Because I, I think you have to, you know, unless you have a frame saw that is designed, you know, with a blade that's got 600 teeth on it and it's running on bearings and it's like, you know what I mean? Like, I I just don't think it's feasible for a lot of people's shops. Now, I'm not gonna say everybody doesn't have this problem. There are a lot of, there are people out there who have setups that will allow them to do that right off of the saw, but I'm willing to bet that 80% of people, keeping in mind that 87% of stats are made up on the spot, do not have the equipment and the setup knowledge to get it right off the saw. So if you don't, if you don't have that, do it roughly and then bring it over and trim it up and then take a thousandth of an inch off at a time with a plane and get it to fit nice. That's my thought. Yeah. So much work, so much work. Uh, 45s are, uh, they're just, so much work. So uh, my my approach is to when I can. So if I'm doing picture frames and I want a, a 45 degree, then I have a jig for the table saw that is a 90 degree angle and I cut on one side of the blade and I cut on the other side of the blade. And it's pretty darn close to being 45, but it's not perfect. And yet it's complimentary or whatever that is. Sure. That uh, 40, 45. So um it always it always works as long as you remember to cut on both sides of the blade. I'm sure you could set up something like that, you know, for the table saw where you've got a V running over the blade, you cut on one side and on the other. But you know, you've got to be making dozens of these boxes to invest in that kind of jig. And um yeah, I, I get a forty five cut and then I fuss with it with my low angle block plane. I'm pretty happy with that. The other thing is um, excuse me, um Clamping these things up, um, number one, a miter isn't strong enough all by itself, I don't feel. So, um, and I want to get really good pressure on it. I, I'm at a point now where I don't mess with band clamps at all. I try and get clamping blocks either glued on to a miter or have I have some pieces of plywood with a V cut in them so I can set them right over the joint and get C clamps on them and really get a really great joint, great clamping pressure on the joint. Yeah, the cutting's only half cut. the battle. Oh, yeah. it's just the start. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, you know, you see these guys and they open, they unfold and they've got packing tape and they just fold it together. Like, okay, I don't know. It's, it's certainly, I've done a lot of case work with, with uh, spline miters and keyed miters. And, uh, well, I can't, you can't pull it together with a band clamp. And uh, so I, I've gotten to the, to the point where I'm really comfortable gluing on a piece of cedar or pine, cross grain to right near the joint with a 45 cut into it. And then I'm clamping right over that. And it's really easy to knock off. Mm-hmm. There's it's kind of disposable, but boy, you get so much better pressure there at the joint. Yeah, it's just, yeah, fussing, nothing but fussing. Calling all woodworking enthusiasts. Don't miss the Texas Woodworking Festival happening in Austin, Texas on August 26th and 27th. This event is a unique blend of an industry trade show, tool sale, educational seminar, and a woodworking themed festival. Meet and connect with fellow woodworkers, lumberyards, woodworking organizations, content creators, furniture makers, and tool manufacturers. Enjoy live music, delicious food, and cold beer while exploring the latest tools, trends, and techniques in woodworking. 
Get your tickets today at texaswoodworkingfestival.com and use the code SHOPTALKLIVE to get 10% off your purchase. Keep woodworking weird. This question is from Greg. I've been woodworking for about five years, and although I'm a hobbyist, I managed to log somewhere between 20 and 30 hours a week in the shop. Good on you, Greg. Uh, I have a table saw, lunchbox planer, router, uh, CMS, which in my head as a web guy is content management system, and I have to stop and say, uh, what is it? Uh, Compound miter saw. Compound saw. (laughs) And a Carlisle Lynch style lathe, but I don't have a bandsaw because it's both because both cost and space prohibitive. I like Queen Anne style furniture, but because I don't have a bandsaw, I find myself cutting curves with a pattern bit on the router. This works well enough most of the time, but I found that thicker stock, three inch thick for cabrio legs, is hard on the bits and probably the router it ends up burning or tearing out the wood. Lately, I've really enjoyed using working with hand tools. What hand tools would you recommend I consider adding to my toolbox to do the job of a bandsaw? Okay, now wait, 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 wait. I'm just going to suggest if people listen to this podcast normally, what I want you to do is I want you to go to YouTube and I want you to come and to this watch- segment <laughs> and I want you to watch... Gary, Gary. Rogowski's face <laughs> as this question is being read out. <laughs> I'm sitting over here giggling to myself because yeah. not only, like, don't ever play poker, Gary. <laughs> I was I was reading it, and the text is right next to Gary, and, like, I had a hard time not right. watching right. Gary instead of reading it. So I'm not even going to chirp in on this Now one I'm be- blushing. Yeah, I'm not even going to chirp in on this one because I know exactly what Gary's going to say, and it's going to be a hundred percent. I'm going to be a hundred percent in agreement. So, Gary, <laughs> give her. Well, the hand tool you need to buy is called a bandsaw. Bingo! <laughs> <laughs> will change your life. There is no tool that matches what a bandsaw. There's no machine that can ma- that matches what a bandsaw can do. I just thought, uh, okay, so I've got this timber frame job going on. I've got 12 foot long, six by six beams. I'm cutting a scarf joint with a mortise in them. And I thought, all right, I'm going to buy a bow saw. And I looked at the bow saws available and making my own. And I was like, jeez. I jigged it up to cut freehand on my band. So I've got these 12 foot long posts. It can do so many things. And the footprint, all right, you've got a dust collector with it, so the footprint gets a little larger, but hoses can go up in the air. The footprint for a 16-inch is not much bigger than that for a 14-inch. You can cut curves, straight lines. You can resaw. You can rip. It. The first great machine I bought that changed my life was a 16-inch Yates American Bands. Changed my life. And you just can do things with it that, no other tool can do and and routing oh my goodness three inch stock oh and how are you cutting your patterns with a cnc i guess i you know what i would use i would use a bandsaw to cut my pattern but uh and then clean it up with a spoke shaver rasp but uh, yeah it's go ahead I just jump into the 19th century. You're going to love it. The water's good. The water's really warm. It's great. You know, Gary, I, so I'm so, I'm so happy. I've read enough of your books and I've read and I've gotten to know your sort of like the way you work because I see what you build. And it's like, I think that, I think it's a, I think getting a table saw before a band saw is a mistake. I think if you're, so let's assume that maybe there's a budgetary concern or there is a space concern or what have you. I wish every fledgling woodworker would be have access to someone like you or me who understand that the bandsaw is far more functional than a table saw. Absolutely. I rip with it. I cut joinery with it. I cut curves with it. I resaw with it. Like, and when I cut 
tenons on a bandsaw. I'm not holding on to a jig doing this, huh. hoping that the cheek piece doesn't fly back and hit me in the face because like this is a money maker. <laughs> and so <laughs> I just give you a second in case anybody wants to jump on that. No. no, 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 no. Okay, okay, good, good. All right. The, well, the joke you're... made itself fix. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Gary's hundred percent right. Like the tool you need there is the bandsaw. And I mean, can you get a bow saw and cut cabrio legs? Absolutely you can. But after the first one, you'll hate yourself because it's, it's yeah. it doesn't cut straight. It's going to cut a bowed surface, right? Because you couldn't possibly put enough tension on that blade in order to prevent that from happening. You're not going to have the gullet space to clear the waste. It, it's going to be a disaster. And so, yes, you can do it. Absolutely, 100%. And like Gary's, I love it. Come screaming into the 19th century, baby, and <laughs> get a bandsaw. And, you know, at least a 14. If, if it's a budgetary concern, they make lots of really good 14s now that are made with a Euro body style that are like one piece. You don't have to worry about the flex. You don't have to worry about any of those sorts of things. It's like but, just... Wait, 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 wait. Yeah, but you could do all of this stuff on a f cast iron flexi delta all day long 100 from, from the 70s yes yes you um, can but i'm saying like if you're buying new yeah. yeah right if you're buying new then there's no like i mean they're cheaper than table saws they yeah. are safer than table saws they are they take up like gary said the footprint is tiny right like an apple crate takes up more footprint I just, I, I think like that's the answer. I mean, sure, you can do things by hand. You can do everything by hand, right? And I wrote books on doing things by hand because if that's the road you want to go down, I just wanted people to understand you don't have to use a machine. If you don't want to or you can't or whatever, there's other ways to do things. But if you love, as in this question, if you love Queen Anne furniture, you got a lot of curves going on. Yeah. And that, like... The reason why I like a justification for any machine is to get you to the next stage quicker, right? So if you like Queen Anne furniture, get a bandsaw, sell something else, like sell anything else, get just, a bandsaw. Uh, yeah, I agree, Vic. Uh, I, I moved shops and I went from a big shop to a small shop and the biggest frustration I had in the new shop was, oh, all right, I need a piece of wood that's this size. My table saw is not set up. My planer is not set up. I need, I got to get a bandsaw working because with a bandsaw and a hand plane, I can do a lot of work. I can mm -hmm. mill material. I can get the ability to create a piece of wood any size I want at that moment is it's a necessity. It's not a luxury. I work with wood <laughs> and I have a tape measure and I need to make pieces a certain size and I can do it with a bandsaw and a hand plane. It opens up worlds to you. They're the, they're the most versatile tool in the shop. The first machine you should buy. 100%. So can, can I agree with you both? Uh, amplify a couple of elements because two hands or two, two hand tools, average price hand tools, could buy you a bandsaw, right? Like a spoke shave and a hand plane equal the price of a used, nice little Delta cast iron bandsaw. Well, you're buying Lee Nielsen spoke shave and hand planes. Right. Yeah. 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 So premium so, hand tools. So, <laughs> and footprint isn't a problem, Greg. I think it is the smallest foot, but I have to be the guy to say at some point we have to answer this gentleman's question. And <laughs> oh, bow saw. And so, yeah. So, if you no, don't want to well, get a bandsaw, get a bow saw. Bow saw, but also, if you don't have rasps and files, and you're working on cabrio legs and you know Queen Anne style furniture, you 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 got to think about getting some rasps. You got. You absolutely need rasps. There's no way you can't you can't do the ankle and. 
in the foot without without rasp and files. I mean, your smoke shave will be great until you get to the ankle, and then you, well, unless you get a round bottom, really tiny smoke shave, you're not going to be able to get in there. So, I mean, you can do it with the chisel a little bit, but you know, depends on how refined you want your Queen Anne Cabriole leg to look. I mean, you could do it all with chisels, but it's not going to look clean. Rasp and files are definitely the way to go. Well, and to well, me, Queen Queen Ant, like like a cabrio leg, is not two routed surfaces meeting. There's not. There is so much sculpture to them. You are like I. We did a uh, 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 Queen Anne side chair video that is releasing right now, and with Dan Faya, and there was no router involved whatsoever because it is all sculpture rasp work rough it out at the bandsaw get close to the line go to spoke shave go to rasp go to file go to card scraper that right. is if i if i have to sum up a 30 episode video workshop i just did i'm sorry <laughs> but there's 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 a lot of those things but there's a lot of finesse in every single step you know but um rasps for queen anne furniture i just can't imagine trying to do anything in that style without rasps and files yeah, they're so important i have uh, probably about five or ten rasps thinking about all of them but and and you find that different shapes allow you to do certain jobs better than others i have a little tiny one i got from tools for working wood it's like Three eighths of an inch wide, stainless steel. You go, oh well, thank you for the gift. It's you know nice. He uses it all the time. It's so great <laughs> for little tiny stuff. And you know, I've got a big dragon rasp. I have a couple of those. Um, and and uh, you know uh, the cabinet makers rasp Nicholson. So yeah, are you a fan of rasps, Vic? Sorry. Are you a fan of rasps? I don't think. Oh I've yeah, ever I love them. Oh, oh, yeah, okay. I have. Uh, I have like hand stitched ones. I have Nicholson ones. Um, I have um, Japanese style rasps. Um, not not the Shinto rasp, which is also a good rasp, but uh, for like you know for really coming at something. Um, but like the finer sort of with the radius uh, carved into them. Um, yeah, I think they're fantastic. If you have to do any sort of freeform shaping, uh, you know, it's part of your toolkit. It's like, you know, I couldn't imagine. I mean, I don't do a lot of sort of freeform sort of stuff, but where I did use them a lot was when I was making hand tools and hand planes. And, mm. you know, you needed to shape it and you needed to like make it so it felt good in the palm of your hand. And so you had to remove material judiciously. It's like there's no router bit for that like you can't just put like a quarter inch round over and go all the way around a hand plane and go yep done right well you can but it's not going to be your plane it's going to be a plane um i like making them my plane which means that they're shaped funny and they're off they're not they're not symmetrical and you know there's some areas that are still have bandsaw marks on them because you know i want that little bit of grip and so i mean it's yeah i mean a rasp is a fantastic tool um you know, half rounds, rounds, flats. I have some that are safe on the edges um, so that you can work up to an adjacent surface and not worry about marring anything. Um, yeah, I mean, they're just, <laughs> I think if you own a bandsaw, you need rasps because it stands to reason <laughs> that you're going to cut curves with the bandsaw and then you're going to need to refine those curves. I mean, you know, you look at the way Maloof used to work where he'd like throw his pattern on the floor beside his bandsaw and then he would look at the pattern and start cutting and it's like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, as accurate as that was and as terrifying as it was, and please at home don't do that. Um, but he had to refine everything with rasps and, you know, and he's sort of like the, as far as I'm concerned, Maloof is like the king of like natural form and like being able to get things to blend and smooth out. And even in his own home where he had designed and built stuff like, you know, it, it just, you look at what his toolkit was and it was a bandsaw, rasps, card scrapers, you know. Yeah. I agree though, get the bandsaw if you can. 
Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. It really, it'll, yeah, change your life. Game Get a good changer, one. for sure. Get one. And if you really like it, then get a good one. I just don't think that people need to be like setting the bar because, because he, he said cost prohibitive, you know, like, so that is, that is a legitimate unmovable object in the, in the way. Right. So let's, let's not think that, you know, $1,200 for a good bandsaw is just available. Um, but I, I do think that there, there is value in lesser expensive, uh, old bandsaws you'll find on marketplace and stuff. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I'm Vic, raising my it. finger in objection. Yeah, All right. Um, when you buy bad machines and don't get the results you expect, then you blame the machine. And, and, and I completely get that. I bought a, my, my first joiner was a four inch tabletop joiner. Uh, piece of piece of junk and then i bought a six inch and for the next 20 or 30 years i would just oh, needed a bit it would have cost me 200 dollars more and i would and i could have bought an eight inch and um so saying this is i do title these shows because the theme of this show should be Here's your list. Install hinges, true doors, <laughs> buy a bandsaw. Well, there's all this stuff that comes underneath that because it's not, you just, it's not like buying a, a Bluetooth speaker, you know, well, it's plug and play. Once you get it to find it, then it's, it works. Bandsaws are tricky. And, um, and if you buy a crappy one, you'll be unhappy and you'll say that we're all idiots, which you're, Right, but if you How get about a good that? Bandsaw, <laughs> yeah, if you get a good bandsaw, it it's it really makes a difference. So um postpone it. Save your money. Would oh uh, oh okay, so that, that was my follow up. Would you would you rather have no bandsaw or an eighties cast iron delta for three hundred dollars? Uh, you know, I'd work with the cast iron delta, but I'd be, I'd be expanding my swearing vocabulary, uh, which is already prodigious. I already can swear yeah. in languages. <laughs> in fact, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, you'd use a crappy bandsaw, but you'd only use it for certain jobs, you know, cutting templates or, you know, quarter inch plywood or something. You wouldn't use it for resawing or, or ripping. Um so there are there are limits uh, that bad equipment can get you. Back to the uh, router bits, I bought a a, a forty five degree chamfer bit, big guy. You make boxes? So, of it? are you kidding? I looked at it, <laughs> and it was like fifteen bucks, big sucker, and I was like, this is so cheap. And I looked at it, and you know, there's brazing to hold the carbide on. It was missing like two thirds of the brazing. There are big gaps on it. I've never turned it on and used it. You get what you pay for. It. And buying cheap sometimes can be dangerous. So uh, not usually with the bandsaw, but um, you don't get, get all the benefits if you buy in at too low a price point. So I would, you know. But if you're just doing cabriole legs, quarter-inch uh, blade, you know, a, a delta, you know, a cheap delta would be just fine. So I have a point about the $300 Delta and I agree with Ben hundred percent. Like you can, you can get these machines. I remember having a conversation with Raleigh Johnson one time. It was at a fine woodworking live and he, we were actually talking about cars if memory serves, that, but it applies that tracks, it, which is, <laughs> you know, common with, with, if you know, Raleigh, you know, um, but there's a triangle when it comes to old cars and old tools. And at one point is uh, money, at the other point is experience, and at the other point is time. And if you don't come close to having equal, num equal proportions of those, buying a used machine can be a real dog. 
because like I had uh, my first bandsaw was uh, was even worse. It was a rigid that I bought a, a, a block for because, of course, it was made this exact same pattern as the Delta. And so I could just put a Delta uh, riser block in there and all that. It took me hours to get those wheels so that they were coplanar and that they were running true and I had to like tighten things up and loosen things off and like put shims in places and it's like I consider myself a pretty handy guy but not everybody knows how to do that and so you know you spend three hundred dollars right and then you end up spending the majority of your time trying to fix it and it never really works right now I'll be fair I did get it working pretty darn good um, but um, the $300 bandsaw comes at a price, right? And the, the, the one barricade, you're removing one of the barricades, which is the financial barricade by buying a $300 bandsaw, but there are two other prices that you have to pay and those have to be taken into account as well. Your time and your knowledge base, right? Now I know- Both YouTube, of which are easier to deal with for many people. Right. If and you don't so, have money, so, you don't yeah, have money. Yeah. I get it's it. just, yeah. So, so like I, I would, I would respectfully say I have helped three people now buy old Delta bandsaws for half what I paid for my Grizzly, which is a, which is a, uh, a knockoff of a Delta. And there is great machines out there. Um, be patient, uh, be weary, you know, and don't try and force it to do something it's not meant to do. The, the adding a riser block to it, which I have a riser block on mine, but adding a riser block to it is, 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 is really pushing the limits of that saw, right? Um, expecting it to resaw. Uh, anything more than four inches of reasonable wood is pushing the limits of that saw. But if you are someone who is wanting to cut curves and has no bandsaw and into queen and furniture and money is a problem, I think that there are bandsaws out there that would do the job you ask of it or you need it to. Um, and I, you know, I've worked on great bandsaws and they are a joy, but I am just, oh, so happy to have a bandsaw, which is what I can afford. Right. So, and there's a yeah. really good article fine woodworking did years ago. I think it was one of fortune's articles on setting up a bandsaw Yeah, because he's got like 27 bandsaws and they're all varying sort of, you know, some are like old beavers. Uh, some of them are, you know, but he was able to tune them up and get them working and, and all that other stuff. So if you're going to buy like that step one, if you're going to buy a $300 bandsaw and, and it's going to need some tune up, then read that article because yeah, agreed. that is, uh, that's basically how I learned. Um, I was fortunate to have him teaching at Rosewood uh, for a few weeks. And so I learned firsthand how to tune up a bandsaw. And that's been valuable because Gary said earlier, like bandsaws are not an easy tool to set up. Um, you know, it's not plug and play. There's a lot of tweaking. There's a lot of things that need to happen. Um, so, you know, again, it's that knowledge piece, right? It's going to take, you know, it takes your 300 bucks, but it also takes time and it also takes knowledge. And mm -hmm. the nice thing about you, Ben, is that you've, you said you've helped people, you know, kind of get into the bandsaw game. Well, thank goodness they had the knowledge from you because most people wouldn't have that. Right. And so that's where like, and that's what I do as well. When I teach, it's like, listen, you know, uh, I got a student out in Newfoundland who's got a bandsaw that he can't get to cut straight. And it's like, I'll get that thing cut and straight. You know what I mean? We're working on Zoom calls and stuff. Like, I'll get that thing. Unless there's something manufactured wrong with it, we will get that thing cutting straight and we, you can forget about the illusion of drift and all those other things. Um, so, but yeah, it's, um, I, I, I think what we're all agreeing on is the fact that a bandsaw is tool number one. Yeah, Greg. Not the answer you were looking for, but the answer you got. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Well, I think that about does for this episode of Shop Dog Lab. Blah, 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 blah. Y'all got anything? I've got a class coming up online called Setting Up Shop. Is and this part of the mastery program? No, it's different. Oh, different I didn't know you, you do other uh, individual classes. I thought it was just the mastery I've been doing uh, project classes. We've done three or four different projects. But I was setting up my shop, and I thought, you know, this is my fifth shop. I, do I know anything about this topic? And I, it turns out I do. So it's divided up into chapters of uh, shop flow, which I think is so critical, and then which hand tools to buy, which machines to buy. You know what's at the top right. of my list? <laughs> bandsaw. It's bandsaw. <laughs> so number one. Bandsaw and a jack plane. Uh, it's just so important. <laughs> and then uh, making sawhorses and and uh, strategies for, for thinking about building. We're not really building furniture. We're building stuff. There'll be projects each week, and we're building stuff for the shop, you know, uh, winding sticks and sawhorses and tool racks and that sort of stuff. It's, it's more for the people who are just getting started. It's called Setting Up Shop. Come to my website, northwestwoodworking.com. Cool. Yeah. We will post a link. Right. Trying to get that running. Cool. When When is that? Uh, it's going to start, I hope, late September. I've got to get enough enough folks lined up, but uh, late September, October. We're going to awesome. get, get going. So it's like a two-hour class on Saturdays. Cool. Right on. Yeah. Well, that does it for this episode of Shop Talk Live. Thanks again to Gary and Vic for joining me. Always a good time having you two around. Make sure to head on over to finewoodworking.com slash e-learning to get more information about Matt Monaco's class. I'm looking forward to it. I'm sure you're looking forward to it as well. It's going to be a banger. If you are watching on YouTube, please click that thumbs up button. If you're not and you feel like leaving us a five-star review slash comment, on iTunes, that helps as well. Also, thank you so much to those of you who are subscribers of Fine Woodworking Magazine or unlimited members to FineWoodworking.com. It's because of you that we get to make this show, and it's because of you that we get to do all the cool things that we get to do. Thank you again. All right, we'll be back in two weeks with another episode. Thanks for listening. <laughs>